Okay, so another concept we're going to need is this apparent size, or this kind of angular size, that is generally used to indicate the magnification that an eye will, of an object, right, that an eye will see. So you kind of just say, how much, how many angles is that object taking up in my, in my vision? Or how large of an angle is that object taking up? The object at B takes up this angle, whereas if you move that object up to this position A, it takes up a larger angle. So A has a larger apparent size than B. So something else we might use uh, lenses for is just a magnifying glass, like a simple magnifier. And what you're doing there is using that a convex lens to change the apparent uh, size, the angular size of the object. Right? So without the magnifier, our eye sees the object having taking up this angle, right? it's got a smallish angle here, versus if you have a magnifier and you put the put it between your eye and the object, and the object is within the focal distance, or less than the focal distance, then it's going to create that virtual image that's larger out here, and then if we see what, Im what angle that image takes up in our vision, right, it's at a much larger angle. So that's how a simple convex lens can be used as a magnifier. So you have it in between your eye and have the object like kind of right behind the lens. So for angular size, apparent size, we can define an angular magnification as the angle that the image takes up in your vision versus the angle that the object takes up in your vision. But it's very similar to the other linear magnification, except with angles. Yeah, we're not really going to go through the derivation, and this is a slightly different way of putting it than the book puts it. If you try to relate the magnification to the focal length, then it turns out you also um, end up needing the near point in there, and you end up getting that when your eye is focused out to infinity, essentially, right? When the, you want the image to be sort of at the far point of your vision, then we get a magnification that just looks like your near point over the focal length. When you want your eye to focus at the near point, or you want that image to be at the near point of your vision, then we can get a magnification that is that n over f, just plus one. Uh, all that is to say that the, a magnifying glass you know, can do pretty well to magnify an object, but there's not a lot of range to it. It essentially goes from some magnification and one more or less than that, or more than that. So looking at this example, which we well, could do the calculation for, it's pretty straightforward. Just kind of want to point out the results. Essentially, for a larger and larger magnification with the magnifying glass, you need a shorter and shorter focal length. It's more and more rounded kind of lens, and it becomes not ideal, or it's not really that great of a setup anymore because if you want a much greater magnification, then your eye and the object need to be real close to the lens is what ends up happening. And it's just not a great set of awkward. And so to resolve that, or to kind of get around that, you start doing things where you use multiple lenses together, make things like microscopes. This is probably the simplest kind of microscope, which is two convex lenses. And with just the two, you can have more than that, but think about just the two lenses here, where the front lens is called the objective lens, the back lens, or the lens right by your eye, is called the eyepiece. And essentially what happens is the first lens, the objective lens, forms, forms this image, as you can see in the diagram here, forms an image of the object that's magnified, it's been enlarged, in between the objective lens and the eyepiece. And then that image ends up becoming essentially the object for the eyepiece, which is now able to form a much larger image of that well, the, the eyepiece image, which was um, created by the objective, the image from the objective. So you see all those rays kind of come together in order to form this final image that's much larger than the beginning one. And then just to show you, if you want to figure out what the magnification of this microscope is, then you know, we would need to kind of combine the magnifications of both the objective lens and the eyepiece lens, and the eyepiece lens is essentially acting as a 
magnifying glass, like simple magnifier, to the image that the objective formed. So its magnification we would generally quantify as an angular magnification, and the objective magnification we use the stream, same uh, linear magnification that we used, looked at earlier when we are just thinking about the convex lens. And as it turns out, the overall magnification is a product of those linear and angular magnifications. And now we're going to go through, not doing derivation here, but just to tell you that this is what you would get, and still using this uh, small angle approximation that we have an approximately equal to. And also to point out some of the notation here that the OBJ, the objective superscript, is indicating these are to deal with the distance, so distance of the image from the objective. So that would be the distance up there right in, in the diagram. It's actually the one that's just indicated as DI. So we get those two things, put them together, and that's your net magnification. So let's go ahead and just use that magnification formula, the net magnification, in order to see how much our simple microscope, just the two convex lens microscope, is going to magnify this object. Let's place 6.2 millimeters from a compound microscope that has a 6 millimeter objective focal length and 50 millimeter eyepiece focal length, and then the objective and the eyepiece are separated by this 23 centimeters. So in order to use that net magnification, well, we already have the focal lengths that were in the um, that are coming to play in that formula. We need to know the distance that the objective forms its image. That's the only other thing really in that formula. And in order to do that, we can go back to our handy formula that allows us to relate focal lengths and distance distances of objects and image. It can be a little bit confusing because the object is the name of the thing we're magnifying. The objective lens is the name of the first lens in this compound setup. So try to keep those straight. So if we just think about the first lens, we can figure out where its image is because we know the focal length, we know the distance that that object is placed from the first lens, from the object objective lens. And I'm not going to write it all out, but plugging in those numbers, we end up getting uh, 18.6 centimeters. Mm -hmm. And if you remember from the sign convention for convex lenses, so essentially we're not even worrying about the eyepiece at first, we just got to think of the convex lens, it's forming this image. Um, as it's shown in the diagram, and the sign that we came out with here is positive, which is good because our sign convention says that for a... Um, an image that's formed on the opposite side of the object should be a positive distance. Right? That's what our equation is telling us. That's what the figure is also showing. All right. So let's just go ahead and use that net magnification formula. And I'm going to be a little loose here. I'm not going to worry about you know, all the significant figures and just note that everything in that formula is essentially in, is in centimeters. We're going to put it all in centimeters. So that objective image distance, uh, the focal length of the eyepiece, and then we need to put in the near point for it, for your eye, which again, we, we're just going to be using 25 centimeters in general. And then finally, the focal length for the objective lens, and again, the focal length for the eyepiece. So minus side in there. There you go. So overall, 186 magnification. Okay. Much more than you would get with just a simple magnifier. Um, it also shows negative sign, or the, it's negative. I mean, this is an inverted image, which um, is what we see when we look at our ray diagram. So everything seems to line up pretty well. And so it's just an indication of how useful, how much more useful a compound magnifying glass or a microscope is versus just the simple magnifier. The next kind of useful thing you could think of making maybe with uh, these lenses are telescopes. Microscope was allowing you to see small object, make a small object that's up close much, much larger to see the detail 
telescopes generally are taking objects that are very far away and at least making them large enough for you to still see um, a little bit better with your eye. A couple of examples of telescopes. One, uh, Galileo made this kind of telescope with a converging objective lens and a diverging eyepiece. We usually call this the spyglass, and it tends to create this upright image that's much, much closer than the actual image, than the actual object is. And you can kind of get an idea of what's happening with that setup is that the converging lens is taking these parallel rays. And remember, if an object is sufficiently far away, then essentially all the rays that are entering this lens are going to be basically parallel. We get all these parallel rays from the object. The converging lens squeezes them together, and then the diverging lens pushes them back apart a little bit. So essentially, you have the same uh, array of light rays that are coming in. They're just much more narrowed down, so they more of them can edge your eye forming an image like that. Um, so most telescopes, refracting telescopes, actually ends up use two convex lenses, and they will form an image that is inverted. Um, as opposed to the upright one with the spyglass. And so you might be saying to yourself, well, that seems pretty similar to the microscope that we just looked at a second ago. And it is, it's a very similar setup. The main difference is that the image that's formed by the objective lens, the image that's formed in between the objective and the eyepiece, that image is going to be smaller than the actual object is that you're looking at. And if you look back at the microscope, the image that's formed in between is larger than the object itself. What that means here is that there's actually no magnification. There's no enlargening going on from, for the objective lens. It's actually only the eyepiece that does any sort of enlargening when it comes to refractive telescopes. Well, what then would we get for the magnification of a telescope? A refracting telescope are these two convex lenses. Turns out it's just a ratio of the focal lengths. Well, let's see how we might get that. So in this picture, you can see that there's a couple of angles labeled theta, the first angle on the left there. Right? If your eye, without the telescope, you're, you kind of imagine your eye would be there uh, and the parallel rays coming in, and theta would be the angular size that you would see of that object. Right? That's the angle that would take up your vision. Versus with the telescope now, theta prime is now the angle that those rays are entering your eye. So that's the new uh, size of that image, angular size of that image, or apparent size. The magnification, the angular magnification would essentially be just like it was before, the angle that the rays hit your eye now versus what they would have. If we want to compare or get a relationship between the angles, theta and theta prime, let's check out some of these triangles indicated on the figure, VO, vertex of the objective to the focal length of the objective, focal point of the objective, down to that I point that's indicated there, I1. And then also the vertex of the eyepiece to the focal length, focal point of the eyepiece, down to this point A indicated on the figure. So I've drawn those triangles roughly here. And if you look back, at the figure, you can see that actually uh, FO to I and VE to A are both the height of the object formed by the objective lens. They're both H. And the vertex to the focal point for any lens is the focal length of that lens. So this is focal length of the objective, focal length of the eyepiece. Okay. So now we can use some trigonometries. Say the tangent of theta is going to be the opposite over the adjacent side. Tangent of theta prime, very similar. Opposite over adjacent side. And there's just one slight wrinkle in that we're measuring these angles in opposite directions. One's measured counterclockwise, the other's measured clockwise. So there needs to be a sign difference between these tangents. And let's just go ahead and say that theta is being measured counterclockwise, so we'll call that one the negative one. Oh, missed that state of prime. And that theta one's going to be negative. And then also, as we usually do, we're going to assume small angles here. 
so that tangent of theta is essentially equal to theta, tangent of theta prime is equal to theta prime, and then finally our angular magnification is our final angle over the initial angle, and putting our values in each focal lengths and the height. The height of that image ends up dropping out of the formula and we're just left with these focal lengths. Right. So it's a pretty nice formula for reflecting refracting telescopes. Essentially if you want more magnification then that means you want a longer focal length, a larger focal length for the objective and or a shorter focal length for the eyepiece. This can cause a little bit of a issue though because if you see in our diagrams, well, and also if you just think about it for a second, the image that's being formed by the objective lens is right around the focal point of the objective lens and in order for the eyepiece to take to use that image to form the secondary or the final image, the eyepiece needs to be behind that as well. So the eyepiece needs to be outside of the focal length of the objective. But if we want more magnification, we make a longer focal length of the objective, which ends up essentially making it so that the telescopes end up kind of getting elongated if you want good magnification. One way of doing it at least. And there's an example right there. Refracting telescope, very long, and the objective lens they're showing is uh, 40 inches in diameter. Things can get pretty large. Um, a couple other just things to note about kind of difficulties that arise when making refracting telescopes is well, you want to make it a bigger lens in one sense because the larger lens allows for more light to be collected at the same time. But the larger you make the lens, the thicker it ends up being, and the lens itself starts absorbing light that's passing through it. Instead of the light just transmitting nicely, it's more and more of that light starts to absorb and you don't even get as much light anymore. One other thing is just the sheer size of a lens like that is so large that it starts to, it can start to deform itself. Right? Its own weight is kind of crushing it down. And the last thing about telescopes is you might have noticed that uh, the refracting telescopes we looked at, they all formed these uh, inverted images, flipped over, which can be a little bit annoying and it can be downright dangerous in some situations. If you're trying to look at an object and it's inverted, it can really throw off your orientation, navigation, particularly in like in shipping um, and anything, anything with a scope on it. You really want the image to be upright. You don't want it to be inverted because inverting up and down also will invert that left and right and it's very confusing. So in order to get around that, to fix that, you essentially can just put in another lens in between. It's called the erecting lens. It essentially erects the image so that it ends up being upright. Okay, and the last topic here, I told you that we were gonna talk about refracting stuff for quite a while, and we did. But finally, we're gonna end on uh, reflecting telescopes, right? Get back to reflecting. We have these two main kind of categories of reflecting telescopes, where, uh, the Newtonian one, and this uh, Cassegrain, or Cassegrain, however you say it, I think he's French, so it's probably not great. Anyway, in the Newtonian one, they're both using these concave reflecting spherical mirrors. The light from these distance ob distant objects are coming in parallel, and so when they come in parallel and hit these small concave spherical mirrors, all that light gets um, directed to the focus of that mirror. And if you put another mirror, the Newtonian one, you put a flat mirror, in that point, and that, that then just reflects it up to this eyepiece, which is probably a, a refracting lens, so it can converge those again, and your eye can see the image. In the Cassegrain one, they're the same idea, except for the light doesn't get focused off to the side and the eyepiece, the light actually comes straight back. There's a, a little hole in the spherical mirror itself, and the light gets um, directed through that hole, the eyepiece is behind it. Some very famous examples of these telescopes, these refracting telescopes. Hubble is probably the most famous 
Uh, you can't see the setup inside Hubble, but it's essentially just a, it's complicated, very complicated. The simple breakdown of it is that it is that spherical concave reflecting uh, mirror, and that mirror focuses light down to the focus, and then that gets directed to the uh, sensors and various different sensors. The newest, or one of the, probably the newest telescope, space, space telescope, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, which just launched last year, 2021, uh, and is now on its way to, to its orbit, where it's going to stay and get us some really cool pictures. And you can actually see the refracting or reflecting spherical mirror. It's not uh, totally circular because it's actually made up of these, like, I think hexagonal pieces, but they're put together and ground in such a way that they form this reflecting sort of spherical surface. And then all the light and then other, not just visible light, but electromagnetic radiation that lands on that surface gets directed down to this other, not eyepiece, but where the focal point is, gets directed there, and then it will get, from there, it will get uh, shot back into the center where you can see it goes through and into some all kinds of very fancy sensors. All right, and that's it for optics. It's a lot of stuff. Hopefully it made sense sometimes, some places. Next time, I think we're doing interference of light. So, till then, you have a good one.